Hello, and welcome to the San Diego Union Tribune's Festival of Books. My name is Marika Jeffrey, and I am a youth services librarian with the San Diego Public Library. And today I have uh, the great honor of interviewing three wonderful talents in the children's book world. Uh, my first two guests are Jenny and Matt Holm. They are a sister and brother duo. Hi. Hi. Hi sister and brother duo who uh, collaborate together on many different uh, incredible, funny uh, children's book graphic novels. Uh, some of their series include Baby Mouse, which is what we are going to be talking about today, as well as Squish and the Sunny series. They are both New York Times bestselling authors, and they have also won an Eisner Award, which is basically like the Oscars of the comic book industry. So welcome. Thanks. Thank you. And my other guest is critically acclaimed author Mary Rose Wood. She has written many books for children and young adults, including the wonderful six book series, The Incorrigible Children of Ashton Place, as well as the beautiful animal fantasy that we are going to be talking about today, which is called Alice's Farm. So welcome, Mary Rose. Hi, it's great to be here, Marika. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so I actually have um, both copies of your books with me today, which I'm excited about. I've got uh, this Baby Mouse, Tales from the Locker, uh, Whisker Wizard, as well as Alice's Farm. And so to get us going, I was wondering if uh, each of you would be willing to talk a little bit um, about your books, especially for audience members who might not be familiar with your novels. So um, Matt and Jenny, do you want to go first and tell us a little bit about your star, about Baby Mouse, and talk also about uh, Whisker Wizard? Sure. So so Baby Mouse Tales from the Locker is um, more of a, of a middle grade series. So the original Baby Mouse series was 20 books, and it was all graphic novels. And they originally came out in 2005. And so we saw a lot of, we've had a lot of kids grow up on them. And one question we were always getting was, when is Baby Mouse going to go to middle school? Because in the original book, she's in elementary school. Mm -hmm. And around that time, my own children were starting to go to middle school. So it seemed like perfect timing. And so we kind of spun it off as the Baby Mouse Tales from the Locker. Um, this book is about, so Baby Mouse is obsessed with her whiskers, you know, kind of the way we are obsessed with our hair <laughs> and, 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 and whisker products in general. I am a little obsessed with hair products because I've got very fine, fluffy hair. Um, but in Whisker Wizard, Baby Mouse becomes a internet sensation by styling her whiskers in interesting ways. And, you know, I, I came up with this idea because at the time, my daughter, who is now 14, she was 12 and she was really obsessed with all these makeup YouTube videos uh -huh. where a, usually a YouTube star like does this elaborate makeup and hair routine. But behind the real, what she was really interested in wasn't actually the makeup. It's that they're always like fighting with each other. They're always, there's always some kind of gossip going on. And, and she was just glued to this the way that I was glued to soap operas when I was growing up. So it just seemed like such a perfect topic. Awesome. And um Matt, did you have anything you want to add to as as the? Oh, just just how much uh, <laughs> how much fun it is to draw a baby mouse uh, encountering every possible product in the world that she might imagine, and you know things the things we do for our hair, except all applied to whiskers in her world because they're all animals in baby mouse's world. You know, she's your average your average middle school girl, but she and all of her friends are different animals. Yeah, yeah, she's absolutely hilarious. Uh, awesome. Thank you so much. And so Mary Rose, would you be willing to um, tell us a little bit about Alice's Farm and why uh, young readers will want to pick up this book? I would be delighted to. I also have to say, Jenny, I too have very fine fluffy hair and I share <laughs> your interest in products. So we definitely have to commiserate after this um, panel is over. We can share some product recommendations. <laughs> so Alice's Farm, A Rabbit's Tale is a middle grade book and it too features a brother sister duo at the core. On the cover, we see Alice who is a wild rabbit. She's an Eastern cottontail. Uh, she has a brother named Thistle who lives with her in her warren. And she's in uh, what 
folks on the East Coast will recognize as the Hudson Valley, which is a kind of a part of upstate New York. And it's the valley between the hills to the animals and it's a beautiful place and it's where they live. Um, and it's been very peaceful because it's, uh, uh, the farmland that they live on is for the moment vacant. The farmhouse has been empty for a couple of years, which is a lifetime to a wild rabbit. But then a family from Brooklyn who have zero experience with farming, but who get swept up in a kind of romantic, idyllic dream of returning to the land, leaving their over busy city life behind. And, um, getting to be for organic sustainable farmers and really living their ideal life moves into the farm and all of a sudden their world is upended because what the rabbits quickly learn is that these farmers who are traditionally and i don't have to tell any fan of children's literature this <laughs> the enemies of rabbits farmers and rabbits are like the hatfields and the mccoys right absolute mortal enemies these particular farmers are so incompetent, well-intended, but incompetent as to be both harmless in a sense, but also to be putting the land itself in danger. Because if this farm fails, the real estate developer is going to come in and do what uh, real estate developers sometimes do to farmland, which is to convert it to a more profitable use. When the rabbits come to understand this uh, under Alice's vision and leadership, um, they figure out that they are, in order to save the home that they all share, they're going to have to do what no rabbit has done before, which is to literally become farmers themselves. So the animals of the valley sort of take up this madcap scheme to learn how to farm, to farm when the humans aren't looking and to make sure that this farm succeeds. So I've, I have to say, um, one of the comparisons that you know people have made is you know charlotte's web meets watership down it is definitely a big rabbit adventure like watership down although um much more peaceful but mm -hmm. the, thematically and in terms of the tone of the story the depiction of life on a farm is was very important to me to grapple with uh, because farms have changed a lot since the days of charlotte's web and i've always been fascinated by farming which we were also dependent on uh, Otherwise, there's no food on the plate, right? right. So my my desire to kind of look at the the uh, the role of farmers, the the problems that farmers face in a contemporary way, but also write a rollicking animal story, uh, kind of led me to this book. That's great. And actually, Mary Rose, while I was reading um, your book, it really I, I I wrote Charlotte's Web question mark while I while I was reading, and you know Peter's Rabbit or P uh, Peter Rabbit, um, and one of the things that I wondered was whether or not you kind of set out to write a modern classic, because that's really how it felt to me. And it seems like a book that would stand up, you know, 50 years later. I mean, did you go in thinking, I want to do an animal fantasy that feels very classic in, in, its, in its writing and its style? Well, first of all, Marika, I am literally blushing. That is just about the kindest thing that you could say, I think, to any author. Um, the feeling of a book that's going to stand the test of time and whose message um, might endure, you know, past one's own span on the planet. I, I mean, I think that that's what most of us are swinging for, you know, anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, when I sit down to work, I, I do draw a lot of inspiration from the books that shaped me growing up and the books that I know have been around for a while that continue to shape readers, that kids continue to pick up. Um, Charlotte's Web to me is an example, not the only one, but an example of a pretty much perfect middle grade novel. And it is um, my definition of a classic, if I can be so bold as to use that word since you did, would be a book that um, can be read at different times in one's life and ha and reveal different meanings. Mm -hmm. um, I know from what I've heard from readers that Alice's Farm, it's not a short book, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a big novel, but, um, but it's, it's reading very well for the kids and it's also working really well as a family read because it has something to offer readers of different ages including the parents and in one of my favorite um reader males including the baby 
Because <laughs> there's actually, listen, in a book where rabbits are the protagonists, surely we can have a talking baby, right? Like there's a baby character who has quite an important role to play in the plot. And uh, I heard from one family that their three-year-old was entranced by the read aloud because finally a character that she could really relate to who plays a very heroic role. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, Marika, but I, uh, I, I would be humbly honored to think that this book would have that kind of staying power. And uh, as for my intention, that's always my intention. My, my intention always is to write the very best book I can. Wonderful. Thank you. So uh, there, there's not a whole lot of similarity between um, your two books. However, of course, there are animals uh, in, in both of these stories. And so I was curious uh, whether or not there's any difference in writing an animal character versus writing a human character or is it pretty much the same because basically the animal is kind of standing in for for a human or, or is it easier is it harder is it basically identical well i think for baby mouse the the animals are completely a stand-in for humans 100 mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um the one thing that's nice is we get to have some it, it, we get to sort of like take and leave what we want from the animals, we don't have to, uh, you know, we have to, we make baby mouse so that she can, you know, walk around and carry a backpack and ride a bicycle and those sorts of things. So she's not shaped exactly like a, a real mouse would be, you know, her legs are a little bit longer, that sort of thing. She stands upright. But with the animals, we can do the fun things like have the antagonism between cats and mice, or, you know, we can have, you know, a giraffe who's just like that kid in school who's really tall. You know, and so that's always like the problem that the that the giraffe has. Or you can have like really weird animals, like we have like a jellyfish who shows up sometimes, and and it's like, well, if you have a jellyfish, how does the jellyfish carry his books through school? And so I'm like, maybe each book is in a different tentacle or something, you know, going down the hallway. So so, so sometimes you can play around with the different animal traits as you're working on it. That's so cool. I absolutely love that, that the imaginative joy of imagining yourself into the physicality right, <laughs> of a creature, a giraffe, an octopus, so different. It's such a pleasure for the writer. And of course, if we can pull it off on the page, then it becomes an opportunity for the reader to have that imaginative experience as well. And what could be more fun? Right. Uh, you know, it's like they get turned into that animal for a while. <laughs> um, I did a ton of research, I want to say. Uh, it was one of my intentions in Alice's Farm to depict the animals with as much accuracy as possible. So the animals in the book, if you just put aside the fact of what they do, they, they decide to learn to farm and that our hero Alice is able to broker a truce between all of their natural predators in order to create the kind of teamwork that would allow this to, like, okay, maybe not completely plausible, <laughs> but in terms of their physicality, their habits, the way they interact with the landscape, I, I did a ton of research because I wanted that to be accurate because the landscape itself, the planet Earth, you know, the relationship that we have to the environment is so much at the heart of the themes of the book. Yeah, that's great. That's real insight. Um, wonderful. So another question um, for for all of you is I'm I'm interested in in your process. You've talked about it a little bit in terms of you know um, the research that um, you have to do, uh, but um, Jenny and and Matt. Baby Mouse has been around for a long time, right? You, 2005, and you know, has she evolved? How, how do you guys work together? Um, especially because I know that you're not in the same physical place. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how you guys collaborate together to create your books? Sure, so actually, ironically, Matt is in um, the Hudson Valley. Yes, I was, <laughs> I was out cleaning out our chicken coop today, like a good <laughs> urbanist turned rural farmer. <laughs> And I used to live in Claverack too. So did you, in, in your book, Mary Rose, do you, um, is there a town that you call out or just the Hudson Valley in general? Yeah, it's, I don't call out the town itself, but it is certainly inspired by the real experiences of many people that I know who have had the impulse to- It yep. feels extremely contemporary, I have to say. <laughs> and when, when we had the, I moved from Brooklyn to Claverack, this is many years ago. This is like 2003, so. Yeah, so that was 
that I feel like my life is your book, maybe. I don't know. Am I a rabbit? Oh I could be. <laughs> maybe. Um, but yes, uh, like Marika said, I, I live in California, so I'm near San Diego, sort of. I'm in Costa Mesa, so I'm just up the coast. And Matt is in New Paltz. Um, we've actually never lived near each other uh, when we have been working on the book. We, our spouses have taken us in very different directions. Um, and so what we usually do is we, um, the way our collaboration works is we split up the responsibilities. I mainly manage the writing and he mainly does the art, but we do each way in on art and text. And the way it starts is for any book, we come up with a general idea, like a theme, and then I'll, I'll beat out the story, um, often using a storyboard, which is how they make animated films. Mm -hmm. And then, oops, little bug flying around. Um, <laughs> go away, bug. Um, and then I'll send it to Matt and he'll usually put in his two cents. So Matt actually was an editor before he became a cartoonist for a magazine editor for many years. So he has, you know, worked in the writing industry. And then after our, we do our pass, our editors get in there and we revise several times and then it's Matt's turn to start drawing. Yeah. And I, I do a lot of, uh, rough, disconnected thumbnail sketches, uh, just trying to draw everything that Jenny's described in the story, usually. Um, and then I'll send all these, the, like the, I'll scan the whole sketchbook in to the computer and, and email to Jenny. And then she'll go through and sort of pick and choose which drawings to use and which ones not to use. And she'll be the one who actually figures out the layout for the comic. So it's, I, I always like to say, it's kind of like a video editing model. You know, Jenny's written the script. And now I go out and sort of shoot raw footage. And you know, some of it's gonna make it in and some of it's one up on, on the cutting room floor. And so then Jenny pieces that together, sends the layouts back to me, and then I'll use those uh, to redraw the entire thing with, uh, with a better quality. And, uh, and all my artwork's done in the computer. Uh, so I, you know, I can do all of my inking uh, digitally with, uh, with the little digital pen and everything right on the screen. And uh, yeah, although I will say the uh, the process was a little different for the middle school Baby Mouse ones, the Baby Mouse Tales for the Locker, like Whisker Wizard, mm -hmm. uh, simply because it's closer to a chapter book. It's one of the sort of the new hybrid comics that you see, like, yeah, like that, Diary of yeah. a Wimpy Kid mm -hmm. or Dork Diaries or any of those sorts of things where it's mm -hmm. a pretty heavy mix of comics and text. So uh, this was a little bit more like drawing doing just a very heavily illustrated chapter book although there'd be times where i'm like okay this is going to be a big spread and sometimes it turns straight into straight comics running through with multiple panels per page that kind of stuff mm -hmm. and then for for these books i tend to do a lot of uh a lot of design work which uh, I, I used to do web design and print design and thank goodness because i'm designing web pages that baby mouse is on yeah. i'm designing social media apps that she's working show with. some of the apps oh there. my gosh here let me uh let me share the screen <laughs> just because it, it, we had to put all this in because you know obviously children today are we're all on, on our everything. we're all on our phones we're all on our apps um so obviously baby mouse is too so there's her there's the website that she goes to which is sort of like a almost like a pinterest for 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 whisker styling called whisker wizards uh, so it's all little stories on things, you know. There's lots of of people texting each other in her text chains. Um, oh gosh, let me see if I can find any of the other apps. There's there's Beauty Beat with all the little beauty videos of all the different animals doing their tips. Oh, and of course she has to use her her little brother helps her out uh, filming her her special videos. <laughs> and then of course the other thing that was fun was designing like ten thousand. Uh, whisker styling products. Oh, yeah, we went a, we went a little nuts actually. Oh my gosh, where's the? Uh, there's one that's in it, like an entire wall of all of her whisker products. Hang on, because you know if you're an influencer, she becomes an influencer <laughs> basically, a whisker influencer, and so companies start sending oh, her their free products oh, to go, yeah. make tutorials <laughs> on you know like a YouTube equivalent on. So. Um, yes, and of course there's all these exciting whisker products out here, but. Uh, but her mom always just buys basic whiskers, which is, <laughs> which is like the Dove soap of whiskers, yeah. right? It's like that, what everybody ends up using at the end of the day. Yeah. And uh, it was kind of fun for me to do this also because 
before I was in uh, a uh, children's author, I worked in advertising and I did work on the Dove account. So it was, I was used to like all this beauty stuff. So it was kind of fun. Yeah, I also love how absolutely clueless she is, Baby Mouse, like when it comes to social media, because like for, for those readers who might not know, she's like, what's a video tutorial? Like, what what is that? And I had to ask a friend, um, it's just very, very funny. So it's like social media 101 for, yes. for all of us. Well, yeah. one of the fun things with Baby Mouse is really a lot of her life is her trying new things. And of uh -huh. course, her always, not knowing that much about him, but being sure that she's great at it, no matter mm -hmm. what. And then and then finding out <laughs> what the reality usually is. Yeah. Um, Matt, I'm just curious, have you ever like done some drawings and you're like, I want this drawing in the book. And then Jenny's like, yeah, no, we're not. <laughs> you're not, not, right? not too much from Jenny. Um, it's usually, uh, only only if it's not clear because that we're we're pretty we're both we both take criticism pretty well on our work and uh, and we're both very pragmatic so and usually just because we're so overworked or we're working on so you know books graphic novels are very long so you don't have a lot of time to really fight over tiny little things so if Jane's like I don't get what's happening here this isn't working I'm like okay let me redo that that's not gonna work but there there are occasional things that get cut for whatever reasons like. Like <laughs> the the cover behind me, the Baby Mouse Monster Mash cover on the big poster behind me, that I, I keep that in my office because uh, that's the cover that got rejected for Baby Mouse Monster Mash, where she's a, it's a Halloween book, but she's a zombie crawling out of the ground there. But they're like, it doesn't look like Baby Mouse when we were presenting to them. So instead we did one, it, which is fair because it's the only one where she wouldn't be smiling. And every other Baby Mouse cover, yeah. she's smiling on the cover, so. But uh, but that was but I always keep that because that was fun. Yeah, yeah. She's she's smiling. Yes. Like, yeah, she's very beautiful. <laughs> model. She's pretty happy. I and the whiskers look marvelous. Okay, yeah, it's the only time she gets straight whiskers, smooth. One and done. Swooping. <laughs> <laughs> um. So so Mary Rose, obviously your process is going to be a, a whole lot different because um you are you're the sole creator the the sole author. It's uh, so unfair, Marika. I have to do it all myself. Listening to these two, I'm really rethinking some of my life choices because <laughs> this sounds so much fun. <laughs> it kind of is. It's kind of great to have someone else. I mean, I mean, at the most like selfish level, you know, you're working on a book and then you send it away to someone and then they work on it for a couple of weeks and send it back to you. You know, that's like a dream. <laughs> it does help from, it, it definitely helps from being overwhelmed. So yeah. I, I am, I do think like collaboration is good, especially for like student writers. Like that's a good thing for two young kids to work on something together so they don't get overwhelmed by writer's block maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I am curious, Mary Rose, because I've heard, you know, our, our writers, are they plotters? Like, do they plot everything out? Or are they pantsers, meaning they go by the seat of their pants and just kind of <laughs> see, see where their the writing takes them? Um, would you describe yourself as one or the other? Or uh, First of all, I, I shout out to using this highfalutin writer terminology, the plotter versus the pantser. I love I, that. I'm <laughs> I'm sure Shakespeare was like got up and said, "Am I a plotter or a pantser?" It's like he didn't wear pants. Did they call? He's a breacher. I don't know what he <laughs> call it in, in that time. So I absolutely love this question because I think it's a bit of a false dichotomy, right? I think it's not so much are you a plotter or a pantser. All writers have to invent material. We all have to enter into a zone where what we're doing surprises us, mm -hmm. and it's a kind of improv. And, uh, you know, I, I actually had way back in the days, you know, my, my, the early part of my creative career, I started out in the theater and I did improv and I, you know, I had other types of creative experiences. And I find that so that really comes to bear as a writer, because there are times when you just need to say, I don't know what happens next. So let's just improv stuff. Like, let me just put a character in a situation and see what happens. And you generate material and that is fantastic. And all writers have to do that. But the other thing that all writers have to do is to take that material and shape it into a narrative, beginning, middle, end, get rid of what is not part of that, you know, have the discipline to 
pare down and really choose what you leave in the frame, right? And so people who are plotters are people who think perhaps that you have to work it all out in advance or need a lot of structure in order to have the courage to sit down and work. And people who are pantsers might have a, like a, a, they might not know a ton about story structure or they might feel um, that the only way that they can invent stuff is to just be completely free, you know? But the problem is if you, if you don't have a good balance between the two, you're gonna get stuck either way. Like if you're a plotter, you're gonna reach the point where your outline is dead. It's just mm -hmm. not as interesting as you thought it was because the more you get to know your characters and your story, the less uh, impressed you're gonna be with this kind of superficial impulses you had before you even started working on the project, right? Like now you're you're deep into it, you know much more about it. Um, so they're going to get stuck, and the and the the pantsers are eventually going to get stuck because they're going to make themselves up. They're going to improvise themselves into a corner, like they're going to lose control of the narrative. So that's sort of my take on it. I am a actually a huge story structure nerd, right? I'm I'm I practice it, I teach it, I mentor a lot of writers. It's something I spend a lot of time doing. I absolutely love story structure, um, and one of the reasons I love it is that. I feel like if I have a really good grounding in what the shape of a story is, and I'm, you know, first act, second act, third act, you know, hero's journey, I'm, I can, I could talk about this for a long time. We don't have that kind of time right now, but uh, the, the more secure I feel in my understanding of what story structure is, the more I know that the stuff that I improvise when I'm pantsing is actually going to be useful, because I improvise within the language of story, and so I, I toggle very freely back and forth between those two modes, if you will. I think most writers have an inclination, but I encourage all writers to not turn up your nose at the other way because you need to do both. I love that. Yeah, so rules, but also freedom within some of your some of your rules. Yeah. That's really great. Uh, okay, so uh, another question um, for all of you is uh, the pandemic has it at all affected the substance of your writing or the process of your writing? Has it has it affected your work as as book creators at all? I mean, we we work at home, so I think what's only changed me is that I have to share my office with my husband. I was pointing and yelling at him earlier as he was going downstairs to be quiet. So he's very loud. So I have been spending more time not at my lovely desk in what was supposed to be my office, but in like the bedroom. Mm -hmm. And I've had my kids home the whole time too. So it's, there's been a lot more people in the house and a lot of snacking 24 seven. So <laughs> yeah, the, the that's only been thing the biggest change for me. Okay. Yeah, and our work has always been remote, which you, mm -hmm. a few years ago when we describe our process, it seemed inconceivable to people. And now they're like, oh yeah. I mean, now everybody works remotely with somebody, you know, some sort of collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of my day-to-day -day stuff, the only thing that's really changed uh, the, is over the course of the pandemic was that, you know, we weren't, you know, we don't go out that much anyway because we're mostly homebodies. But um, not going out at all, we real we sort of shifted our entire work schedule so that uh, in in our house I started working more after dark at night, um, kind of like old timey if I was working after work, you know, after a day job kind of a thing, because. You know, especially during the winter, the hours were so short when there was light that we kind of wanted to do things and sort of like get out of the house, at least around our property and go deal with the chickens and that sort of stuff while it was light. And then after dark, then when I could come in and, and do the actual work at that point. I, I would have to agree that for those of us who are in, accustomed to doing kind of creative solitary work from home it it was like hey world welcome to my world you know this is a little bit what i don't leave my house anyway so yeah I oh know. we're just discovering that you can work in pajamas isn't it awesome <laughs> you know some of these things were just very familiar i did move actually i found that i was living in an extremely noisy neighborhood in los angeles and i moved actually not too far from where jenny is now i moved oh, down to orange county which nice. is much quieter it is and, yeah and more peaceful i really love where i am um i would say if anything and this is this is a big topic it's made me reflect a little bit more on some of the themes that i was 
playing with in my work um, while I was writing Alice's Farm. Oh, look who's here, Ashley. <laughs> we have a special celebrity guest. That's so <laughs> zoomy. A baby mouse and came running. <laughs> Um, but the feeling that I think that we might have all learned, uh, we all learned our own lessons, so I'm not going to speak for the globe, but I, there's a lot that we learned about community, about how much we need each other, about how hard it is to thrive in a state of, uh, of loneliness and disconnection, and, and the, how it, just essential it is that we continue to find ways both to connect with each other on a personal level and to cooperate with each other on a social level and national and international level. Yeah. I love that your cat made an appearance. Mm -hmm. I do too. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> famous. Wow. Oh, that's a great cat. That is a cat. <laughs> <laughs> that's the face you want. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we have run out of time. Um, thank you all so much for uh, for joining me today um, for this interview. Uh, we're going to have some wrap up comments. So um, thanks, everybody, for uh, for tuning in. You can purchase the author's books from our indie bookseller partners at bookshop.org slash shop slash SDFOB. Please consider supporting the San Diego Council on Literacy by visiting literacysandiego.org. You can continue to join us for a full program of author panels, exciting demonstrations, and live entertainment streamed entirely online. All of these videos will be available on sdfestivalofbooks.com. And thank you so much to my wonderful guests, Jenny, Matt, Mary Rose. I really, really appreciate all of you tuning in and answering our questions. Um, my name, again, is Marika from the San Diego Public Library, and we hope you've enjoyed this program. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Marika. Mm -hmm.